joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in hand on high. Praise we the Lord in hand on high. This gift of God will cherish well. That ever joy our heart shall fill. How great our joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Amen. Well, though I'm sad I missed the rapture, I'm glad you all stayed with me. So, <laughs> I always had suspicions about some of you, but I thought there'd have been some other folks with us as well. So, <laughs> First Corinthians chapter sixteen. First Corinthians chapter sixteen. I hope you had a merry Christmas. We'll read, we'll read uh, verse uh, five and six, <clears throat> and uh, we're just going to look at the, this last section in First Corinthians, the parting comments, the closing uh, admonitions of the Apostle Paul, and in them we will see a lot of insight. We'll see a lot of just one of those, some of those things that help you kind of understand a little bit of how things worked in the church at Corinth and in the life of the Apostle Paul and. And there's a lot here. There's a lot in these final comments. And so we'll read our text. We'll pray for the Lord's help. And then we'll get right into it this evening. If you want a title for the message tonight, it's Quit You Like Man. Quit You Like Man or Quit Like a Man. All right, verse 5. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia. For I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey, whithersoever I go. So, Father, I pray that as Paul is uh, in that day planning to pass through Corinth, and as he is seeking the Lord's will and direction in his life for ministering, I pray that we would be able to come to some understanding, not only about how ministry and service works in the church, but God, a little bit more understanding about uh, how we ought to serve and minister. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I really appreciate the candid nature of the Apostle Paul. In particular, I, I enjoy a lot about how Luke recorded the missionary journeys of not only Paul and Barnabas and others of the Apostles, but I love how that sometimes we get some insight, yeah, like in Acts, about how that the Holy Spirit leads and guides, and then other times... <clears throat> individuals uh, have desires in their hearts to do certain things. And... All right. Hopefully it'll be good now. Uh, and, and also how decisions are made to do ministry. And, and I, I want to, before we look at some of these things this evening, I just want to say that serving the Lord is sensible. Sensible makes good sense. It's common sense. You know, some believers, some Christians want uh, these bright light, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me sort of moments in order to know that God has spoken and that the Lord has led. And while certainly I would be in full agreement that we as believers don't dash about like uh, pinballs in a pinball machine from place to place, flitting hither and yon and never really investing ourselves for any period of time in a meaningful way in ministry, I think it's important to be anchored and stay where you're put and that sort of thing. Uh, the Lord's leading for ministry and for direction isn't complicated. Oftentimes it's as simple as delighting yourself in the Lord and Him giving you the desires of your heart. And I think that most of the time for most of us that's the way. Now, I've had a few enlightening minutes or moments in my life. I've had uh, times where the clear hand of God directing me, uh, and usually nor in, in those instances, usually changing my course or my direction. I've had those moments in 
ministry, and I should not only say moments, I've had those seasons in ministry where God is clearly either forbidding me to go a direction or forcing me to go a direction, but clearly God is saying, no sir, you will not do that, and you absolutely will do this in my life. And we see a little bit of Paul's openness toward that in the text this evening. Paul certainly is not writing from the perspective of prison like he does in the prison epistles. Here he's talking about future ministry. We know from looking at Paul when he was headed to Jerusalem that he was going bound knowing that he's going to be a prisoner. Uh, we know that Paul referred to himself in other instances as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we could call this free Paul or, or uh, you know, uh, it should not be emancipated Paul, but uh, it is Paul who is free to go uh, where he desires and where the Lord leads. There will be a time in Paul's ministry where he will be a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ and also a prisoner of Rome. And that will be where the Lord wants him to be very, very plainly. We saw the example of that before Paul in John the Baptist's ministry. Don't you love the time that John the Baptist... It's a bittersweet moment for me. Because as I look at the life of John the Baptist and I look at Jesus' overview of his ministry saying that a born of women there was not a greater man than John the Baptist. And when you look at how greatly God used him in a real time of unbelief, I'm amazed, I, I, I shouldn't say amazed, I'm saddened by John the Baptist being in prison and his ministry clearly being over. And when his disciples came to him and said that Jesus made more disciples or baptized more people than he did, expecting John to say, oh no, I've got competition. John's response being the servants not greater than his master, disciples not greater than his Lord, and he must increase, I must decrease. In other words, John the Baptist's ministry at that time was a call to decrease. He could not be the great John the Baptist and Jesus to be the great Son of God. They would have had competing ministry. And that's incredible to me, the, the decreasing avenue or just decreasing aspect of ministry. I admire men who are greatly used of God who understand the importance of decreasing. I've watched men with great humility transition in ministry to someone and oftentimes seen that someone they transition to take the ministry to another more effective level while they deliberately decrease. Not because of a comparison between them and Jesus, but because it's a decreasing ministry. In other words, if they're going to be what they are, then it's going to be competition. People are not going to know who to look to. And Paul has spoken a lot about in, in this letter to the church of Corinth. He's spoken a great deal, hasn't he, about following him. He's urged people to accept or to receive his discipleship. And he's still in that phase of the ministry. But it's interesting, Paul's commitment, or could I say this evening in our context, lack of commitment. Read, let's read verse 5 again. Paul said in verse 5, Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Now think about that momentarily if you're a church and uh, someone tells you they're going to come to you. Paul said, I'm going to come to you uh, when I pass through Macedonia. I do pass through Macedonia. He didn't say I go through Corinth or I go through Macedonia on the way to Corinth or I go to Macedonia and Corinth. He said, I go to Macedonia. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, just like, well, you know what? If I go to Macedonia, I'll come see you. <laughs> in other words, implied in the statement is Paul saying, I'm not going to come just to see you guys. But I will go to see Macedonia and when I do, I'll come see you. And here we find in Paul's ministry, actually, a little bit of insight into priority. Paul's had a great ministry in Corinth, perhaps uh, the uh, most effective ministry that he ever had while in a city was at Corinth. And truly, if you wish to compare letters of Paul to churches, Corinth is the great, most voluminous material, really, more than Galatians more than Ephesians, more than Philippians, more than Colossians, more than 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, isn't it? I mean, this is, he, he has a lot more to say to them. But it's interesting that they are not his primary ministry. 
Now, you say, Pastor, well, you're making a lot. Well, that isn't, of course, the primary sense, but it is not coincidental, or it's, I should not say coincidental, it's not incidental that Paul said, I do pass through Macedonia. He's letting them know, I'll come to you if I pass through Macedonia, or when I pass through Macedonia. And I do go through Macedonia, so I'll probably come. In other words, he is giving a little insight. And then he said, in verse 6, And it may be that I'll abide. And winter with you that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. Now this is interesting as well. Paul is not here saying to the church at Corinth, I'm going to come there and, and uh, serve you and uh, bring you to another place or another level. He said, if I come there, it might be that it's winter time and I'll stay for the winter. That way you can get me, you can take care of me so that I can get to the next place. If you're from Corinth, how do you feel about Paul's ministry to you at this time? Primary or secondary? On purpose or incidental? I would say secondary. You feel like, well, you know, he's definitely going to Macedonia, and, and so he'll probably come to us. Uh, he's, you know, it's it just it's incidental. It just it happens that he'll be here, so he'll minister to us and. You almost feel like he plans on kind of using the church a little bit at Corinth. You know, he wants to stay with them. And then he wants them to send him on his way. In other words, he wants them to take care of him and give him the means to go to the next place. How would you feel as a church if that were the way the Apostle Paul treated you? Well, first of all, you'd, you'd want to say, well, we're just as important as anybody else. Are they? Well, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, they absolutely are. Sure. So what's with Paul's attitude? What's with the, the demeanor and how he says that I'm coming? He's not being cruel or unkind. You know what it is? He's actually placing in them more trust. He's actually taking them to a level. In other words, the implication here as well is that the church at Corinth doesn't need Paul the way that other places do. In other words, he's not... They're not relying on Paul at this level, at this stage, the way other churches do. And that's why he's going to send some other folks to minister to him, because they don't need him. Go on further in verse uh, in 8. He said, uh, I will tarry at Ephesus till Pentecost. He's saying he's not going to come right now. He said in verse 9, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. And so here he, he the word effectual is, in, is the same word that we use for energy, energia, energy. And so the idea is Paul is saying there's a very, very energized or big opportunity uh, for me, and, it, and there are also many adversaries. Uh, but he is saying to them, uh, I've got a big ministry. And he's not saying, <coughs> you're not the big ministry. But what he is implying is that you have come to a level where you don't need my ministry as others do. It's always a sad time, isn't it, when... Uh, the children grow up, you know, the empty nesters. It makes me want to cry remembering my the, the first time I drove to college. It wasn't even my first semester, but I think it was, no, it might have been my first semester to college. And uh, I remember coming home. My mom was really getting on my nerves a little bit by being a little bit too helicopter parentish. She did all my shopping for me. She did, she, uh, uh, printed out a uh, little sheet of paper about how to do your laundry, like, you know, and not mess things up. Had that for me. And, and I mean, uh, like so much stuff, so many clothes, and I think she used my money to buy the clothes too. And I said, Mom, I don't need this. You know, this is not that big of a deal. You need to... But, but I remember when I went to leave, and I remember her bursting into tears and realizing... Oh, <laughs> she's going to miss me. Like, this is, she's sad that I'm going. And uh, I just, I remember, probably don't think it was my freshman year. I don't, or I don't think it was my first semester, maybe my second semester maybe of school when I was leaving to go to school and just realizing, oh, wow, you know, my mom's actually going to miss my first semester of school. My sister was also in the same college. Mm -hmm. And we both went together to school. And when we got there, that evening, I asked my sister, did you call mom and let her know we made it? And she said, yes, I did. And so I thought, well, that's taken care of. Two weeks later, 
My sister said, Mom's really mad that you have not called her. I let her know you made it to college. I said, well, she knows I made it to college. You made it, and you told her I did. It's just not the same. <laughs> As you calling and telling your mom, I'm, I've learned a few things since I was an insensitive college-aged individual whose life seemed to revolve around his own future and self and so forth. Uh, we tend to be that way, and it's, it's the best thing you can do if to get beyond being all about yourself. But um, Paul is here telling the church at Corinth, implying to them, you don't need me so much now. But then there's someone that could be a help to you. In verse 10 he said, Now if Timothy's come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. So here is handing over authorities, handing over ministry to Timothy. Now we know Timothy was used in a number of places behind Paul to serve and to minister. And in verse 11, Paul says to them the same thing he told Timothy. He said to Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth. In verse 11 of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, he said, let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. So he said, receive him like me and make sure he makes it to me. Carrie, hit him again. Verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos, <laughs> I greatly desired him, to come unto you and the brethren. But notice this. But his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. Now if you felt badly about Paul coming, if it's convenient, how do you like Apollos not wanting to come? <laughs> Paul said, I don't want to go to Corinth. Now stop here just for a minute. I want to give you, if I can, what I think is some insight into it. No individual who is burdened to serve the Lord and to win people and to have an effective ministry wants to go where he's not needed. I've been in churches that have such great people that they don't need me. Worst nightmare I ever had was, uh, this is just a vivid nightmare, uh, was that I got called to pastor a church in Tennessee, a large church with a large staff, and they called me to be the pastor, and that's fine. Churches can do that all they want to, but I'm not going there. I'm going to be in Fort Lauderdale. That's where I want to be. That's where my heart is, and that's where I've been called. But what, for whatever reason, it was just like decisive that this was God's will, God's desire for my life, and I just had to go. And I remember being in the balcony on my first service, watching the outgoing pastor and the staff uh, basically doing my uh, first service in the church and introducing me to the church while I'm sitting in the balcony. And I remember they I didn't preach that day. I didn't speak that day. I'm just in the balcony. We have a new pastor and they're doing this great presentation to introduce their new pastor. And the whole time I'm thinking, this church doesn't even need me. I'm in the balcony. I, they don't even need me. Why do I? I could be in Fort Lauderdale. Why do I have to be at this church where the people don't even need me here? That this staff does everything. The pastor that's here just travels around preaching in other churches because he doesn't do anything in his church, and now I have to be that guy. What self-respecting guy wants to pastor a church that doesn't need him? What apostle wants to minister where a church is doing? Well, you know what it says. It says that the church at Corinth is doing just fine without. Paul and Timothy and Apollos. In spite of the problems that they had, that they resolved, they took care of, in spite of those issues in the church, the church is thriving, it's doing well. And you know what that means? <laughs> we don't get to have Paul, Apollos, and Timothy anymore. And although we love those guys dearly, we don't need them. We don't need them. You know, that's a good thing, isn't it? And Paul is here letting the church know you don't need these guys, you don't need us. We'll come and we might need you, but you won't need us. And that's a different phase. That's a different stage in ministry. And oftentimes that's how the Lord leads. If you ever are used so effectively in your ministry that you've reproduced yourself over and again to the degree that you're no longer even needed yourself, that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful place to come to. And Paul's just letting the church know that. Okay, uh, what else? What else about quitting like men? In verse 13, we see that phrase, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. The phrase quit you like men comes from one word. 
The whole phrase comes from one word that we don't have the exact equivalent for in the English language, but the word essentially means be a man. What we would say nowadays are two words, man up. In other words, do what you need to do. Have courage. Grow up. And here he is simply saying, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. <coughs> and that's what he's saying is, hey, carry your own weight. And uh, do what you need to do. When we start, when do we start carrying our own weight? <laughs> Some years ago, the worst camping trip that ever happened in the world. Uh, we said, well, we might have topped it almost. So the debatably, were, it was the worst camping trip because it's one thing for like five of us to go on a terrible camping trip. It's a whole other thing when like 20-something people or 30, maybe 30 people go on a bad camping trip. But Brother Chris planned this teen camping trip and involved in uh, West Park Baptist Church as well and planned for us to go up to Jonathan Dickinson State Park and do primitive camping. And it sounded pretty neat. We were going to walk four miles, which is, you know, good exercise for teenagers, not a problem at all. We're going to walk four miles, and we are going to camp in a place where you need to make sure you have water and all everything, your provisions, because you have to take everything in, take everything out on foot. Mm -hmm. And so you don't just go to the car and get something. You're, you've walked four miles. And so it's eight miles to go back to the car and come back again, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Nick Wielander, they, the Wielander family were still here. And he had this great idea. He was going to get a make a rickshaw uh, uh, thing to carry, help carry stuff in. And I went to Harbor Freight Tools, and I bought one of those great big wagons with the big wheels on them, you know, to carry stuff in. Now, this is going to be great. Melissa and I went early to go there, and uh, we noticed that the path had just been, it was a path they also used for horseback riding. The path had been freshly plowed. Now, it's very difficult to walk on a freshly plowed path, but it's even more difficult to try to roll something or pull something. And so, all of a sudden, Brother, anyway, brother uh, Nick and uh, a couple, four of the teenagers had the wagon, and the wagon ended up falling apart before it came back home, not just because it was made in China, but because of the abuse that happened to it on the trip. And I could tell you stories for hours of things that went wrong that evening on that four mile hike which was 12 miles from Melissa and I because of bad directions <laughs> that we were given but uh, on, a, on a plowed trail uh, but brother Nick <laughs> brother Nick <laughs> said to all the teenagers in the parking lot hey guys I got this if you want to just put your stuff your tents and your sleeping bags and your gear on it uh, I'll you know I'll roll it in for you guys and so everybody piled all their gear on Brother Nick's thing, and Mindy stayed with Brother Nick, and the two of them are going to roll this thing in. And everybody took off Brother Nick's head, and he gets to the trail and it's plowed. Mm -hmm. And he's loaded down. Go Nick. <laughs> he won't go camping again. He's never gone camping since then. A lot of people have never gone camping since that camping trip. That was like the last camping trip ever for anybody that went on that trip. <laughs> What's that? I said I won't go because of this story. <laughs> <laughs> so this really, this is just, this is amazing. Did you go on this trip, Charlie? Ah, that's why you still go camping. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's dark, and they still have not arrived. The people coming in, and so I had made it to camp after walking 12 miles, and I unloaded my backpack and some other things. I thought, well, I'll go help. I'm getting phone calls when they went in and out of reception saying we're having a hard time making it. So I walked back to meet the group and I grabbed some, just grabbed a bunch of stuff and just, you know, walked a couple miles back carrying it in. And I was thinking about two miles. And when I got there, the kids, some other kids had passed. You know, they'd gotten there because they were not heavily laden. They were just carrying themselves in. And space, well, I remember getting there and I had this heavy tent I was carrying. This kid's like, finally, comes and grabs the no. tent off. Yeah, oh. he says, finally, and comes and grabs the tent. <laughs> I'm like, man, well, you know, what do you mean? You know, whatever. And uh, one of the things that happened, of course, Nick slept very well that evening. Uh, he, and he did survive. He's still alive. He, he did think he was going to have a heart attack several times. And uh, <laughs> one of the things he said, he said, you know, Mandy impressed me. He said, he stayed with me the whole time. Mindy stayed with me the whole time and just helped him. 
He said, we never thought we'd make it, but we did. Quit you like men. <laughs> Quit you like men. Just stick with it and just do it. Mm -hmm. And it's tough and it's hard. And you think, man, somebody else, oh, you know, this is not my stuff. I shouldn't have to carry all this. You know, a lot of people have all kinds of reasons why not to do something. Mm -hmm. Or why somebody else ought to do something. But just do it. Just do it and just stick with it and just stay with it. And you'll be the person that finishes things that other people uh, think that you ought to finish because they don't think they ought to. That's the idea that quit you like that. Paul said to church at Corinth, he said, do what you need to do. Quit you like men. It's a good phrase, isn't it? Quit you like men. In other words, just stick by it and do it. And you know, you don't want to know who actually had a pretty good time on that camping trip. Also, we'll never go camping again, but actually had a good time. Mendy did. He had a good time on that camping trip. He had more fun on that trip than probably everybody else because of the epic haul of all yeah. the gear down a plowed trail with Brother Nick. Potatoes. What's that? Yeah, yeah I, I, know. I don't even want to start on the potatoes. The cooler full of already cooked potatoes that nobody ate and we had to carry back out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was the worst camping trip ever. Potato fight. <laughs> Leave the potatoes behind for crying out loud. Yeah. You know, don't take potatoes. Potatoes are just not the lightweight uh, you know, camping style food to usually think of, unless it's you know. Anyway, we had good hash browns for breakfast. Quit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you like men. That, that, that's the point, though. Quit you like men. Don't just stick by the stuff. And you know, everybody. If you were to tell anybody, hey, you don't need to carry this thing. You need to push this thing down the trail and carry all this stuff. And people are like that's too far. The trail's plowed. Everything's too hard. Everything's too difficult. But a couple of people did it because it needed to be done. And they distinguished themselves. They separated themselves from everybody else in doing it. And uh, that's the way you ought to be as a believer. The kind of person that says, well, it's an insurmountable obstacle and task. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And uh, it's evident that I'm called because here I am. And so until the relief comes or until somebody else is called to it, the task needs to be performed, and I'll do it. And you know, you'll always have people that come along and say, "Well, we found the guardian." That took you forever. You always have somebody that'll come along, you know, an armchair quarterback, and let you know, you know, how much better you should be doing or whatever. You know, uh, we're a little past that phase right now. But a couple of years ago, it just seemed like people were bombarding me with suggestions, <laughs> people telling me things that needed to be done around the ministry, and I'm just thinking. I'm doing things nobody else is doing already. And you, you know, Pastor, you really th ought to think about, you know, and just the most ridiculous, silly things that didn't weren't weren't priorities, weren't important. People are like, you know, you ought to do this. You ought to. In other words, what they're implying is you're not doing a very good job. You know, there's a lot of things that should be done that aren't be, being done, and so you know, you need to you need to do some of these things. And you're thinking, well, job, a need seems a task assigned. What are you doing? You're not doing anything. You're telling me what we can... You know, if we did this a little better, people would come to our church. Mm -hmm. I think, well, why don't you make our church better? Yes. You know, if you showed up for all the services, if you <coughs> invited your friends, if you... whatever, if you committed yourself in a different way, we'd be better and we'd be able to do what you're talking about. A lot of people tell me about these awesome ministries you can have. Well, we could do this, and you could do this. This church is doing. It. I, don't, I don't want to hear about anybody. In church. I can't do it. Can't do anything more. If you, if God's telling you that that ought to be done, then then step in, and carry the load, carry the weight, do it. And we need some of that. And then uh, Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, "Be strong. Be strong." Now that that's an interesting stage uh, phase as well. Hello, young man. Uh, be strong. And, and, they're, and they're not told how, and they're not told uh, what for, they're just told to do it. Be strong. Uh, you know why they need to be strong? Because the job required strength. Well, I'm not strong enough for that. Well, pray tell me who is. You better bulk up. You know, they're just, just you, you know, um, it, it isn't so much this way. I think we had a period of phase in our ministry where just people told me, well, I can't do that. I don't know how. And my question was, well, who does? If it needs to be done and nobody knows how, don't you think somebody's got to learn it? It occurred to me some years ago that everybody that knows how to do something, learn to. 
In other words, that implies they used to not know. Mm -hmm. You know everything you know you didn't used to know? Which means what? You learned. And if the ministry requires learning, be strong. Or just figure it out. Learn. You know, somebody needs to. Well, then. Well, you know, I'm not. You know, I don't have the strength. I mean, I don't have the energy. I don't have that. Better figure it out. We live in a such a specialized era, such a specialized day and age. You know, I think in, in, in uh, early American churches, a lot of churches, and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, a lot of church people were farmers and people settlers, people that settled areas and developed and built areas, and they just had a can-do mentality. Mm -hmm. We're not like, well, I do this thing, and so that's my specialty. But they, you know what? I mean, if you went to a farm, everything there the farmer did. I mean, everything that everything was built, he built. Is a farmer a builder? Well, he has to be. Is he a planter? Well, he has to be. Is he an agricultural livestock manager? Yeah, he has to be. He has to be everything that's done. You know, I, I love farmers. I have just always appreciated. I've never met a farmer who couldn't weld. I sure never met a farmer that didn't know how to use bailing wire and duct tape. But I never met a farmer that couldn't build a house or build a barn or dig a pond or buy and sell real estate or start a business. I just never met a farmer that just couldn't do just everything. You know why? Because on the farm, you don't call somebody to do something, you do it. It's just, that's just the way it is. And you know, they used to be, in our churches in the United States of America, and all, in every state, it used to be kind of the backbone of our nation, of our backbone of our churches, were people, and then, then we had the Industrial Revolution, where people just came up with ideas and had the uh, fortitude to just stick it out and not just have an idea, but develop it and do things, and they were doers. And now we are, you know, um, services, we service things, or we, we have specialists. And, uh, you know, we just don't, we need, we need some more, you know, infantrymen, if you will, in the church. More people that aren't specialized. Because, you know, it seems like the specialist, their, their specialty is just really not the main thing a church does. We need more people that can just do everything. Whatever it is. Be strong. Be strong. And uh, then he said, you have the right attitude. Let all your things be done with charity. And that's a love for the brethren. It's a love for your brethren. If you're charitable towards your brethren, it does not simply mean giving brethren things. It means loving brethren. Mm -hmm. And if you love your brethren, uh, you'll, you'll uh, do fine. You'll get along really well. You know, sometimes it takes a while when the relationship is new for people to find out you love them. Sometimes it just takes a while. You know, you, sometimes... You know, a relationship like that begins with you stating, hey, I, I love you, care about you. But the statement doesn't mean anything until love is shown. And the first time you demonstrate love, people sometimes think it's an aberration or a one-time event. But over time, people know if you love them. The brethren do. And Paul said, be charitable. Be that way, be loving toward each other. Love does overcome a lot. It's difficult to be told or corrected by somebody that you that you question whether or not they even love you to begin with. You know, I'm not sure the guy even loves me, and he's trying to tell me what to do. He's trying to help me. He's trying to guide me. He may not help me, but he's trying to you know push me this direction or rebuke me or whatever. And he doesn't even love me. You can be right about something, but if you're not charitable about it, you won't be effective. And Paul is telling the church. You know, y'all don't need us, but you do need to do this. Quit you like men. Be strong. Be watchful. Uh, be steadfast. And then be charitable. Let all your things be done in charity. And then uh, he, he recommends to them about Stephanus uh, because they had addicted themselves to the ministry, the household. Uh, he said in verse 16 that you submit yourselves unto such and everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. And... Uh, he goes on to, to, to mention a few other things by way of salutation. But this really finishes the portion of Paul's instruction to the church at Corinth 
on how to respond toward his ministry and then how more importantly for them to minister to others and I want to conclude this evening by simply saying to you when it comes from the place where you'd say you know it's not there they act like it's not all about me anymore I was really hoping they'd come and pay attention to me and and help me and do this for me to you know they expect me to do everything do you realize that that is an upgrade in other words what they're saying what Paul's saying to the church at Corinth is I'm expressing confidence that you've come to the place of maturity and that you're useful and effective let me put it this way to to finish out there are some folks that like a handout and there are some folks who like to hand out and I have always been on the side of I'd rather be the guy given to the needy than the guy who's needy or needing to be given to it's not because that means that I have and therefore I'm not needy because I'm the giver I just I just to me I want to be a giver it's embarrassing to me to be the person who's a taker because I think at some level that that shows a little bit of immaturity or irresponsibility on my part and I want to be the guy that pays my bills I don't want somebody else paying my bills I don't pay my own bills you know if I go through the drive-thru and somebody's paid it forward or paid it backward by paying for my meal that never happened to me and I'll be quite frank with you I don't actually care for it to happen to me I don't need somebody to pay for my meal I don't pay for my own meal you understand? So there's folks that need someone to pay for a meal. I, I don't need that. I need you. you say, Pastor, you must be rich. I want to carry my own weight. It's not about being wealthy. It's just I want to be the guy that carries his own weight and carries others. I want to be the guy that's strong and quits like a man. Now you say, Pastor, I feel kind of discriminated against this evening being a lady here. No, the idea here, the, the word that Andre, uh, Andre Zil, Ed Zomeyer, whatever it is, I can't remember exactly about quitting like men. It's a Andre Andras is a mankind term. It's like a, it's mankind. It's it's a you know in other words humanity. And um, but there's a certain gender there to it. Of you know you don't really think of you know I, mean, I know some tough tough I mean, most most ladies are pretty pretty much tougher than a lot of men in their ways. Not, not in a bad way, not in a non-feminine way. Women can be a lot tougher than men a lot of times when they're sick or just going through something and just it's amazing how tough some ladies are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I'm not, not what I'm saying, but I'm just saying this, the idea of is be a man. You know, carry the weight, carry the load, and be that kind of a Christian. And so the letter's not written in Corinth to just the men. Okay, you men be men. Now it says to the church at Corinth, quit you like men. All of you. Everybody there. And uh, I find that to be a great conclusion to a letter of some pretty scathing rebuke and threats of discipline <coughs> to actually ultimately come to the conclusion that you're useful for the ministry and go on and take the next step. Mm -hmm. And that's how Paul leaves this letter, concludes this letter to the church at Corinth. And I just don't see how it could be any better. Father, we thank you for what we've learned this evening. I pray that by example, we would see opportunities to do just exactly what the Scripture commands the church to do. Lord, help us not to be the folks that need someone to come and do our work or serve us, but the kind of folks that can do our own work and serve others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take some prayer requests this evening. Yeah, and so I want to uh, go ahead.